welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, what's all, the, Iceland, what's all the fuss about puffins? Presented by NatHab Expedition Leader, Daniel Blankenheim. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for joining us here today. Over to you, Daniel. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Uh, really nice that I finally get the chance to do a webinar. It's actually my first one, so I apologize in advance for being a little bit nervous, but I hope it will, will go down a little bit once I start talking about what I'm really puffed, uh, <laughs> what I'm really excited about, and these are the puffins. So let's get into it. i show you quickly what we will be talking about today. First, you're gonna meet me. I give a little bit of a presentation about me, but then we come to the exciting things, the puffins, and we're gonna be talking about them specifically in Iceland and um, in their culture there. We're gonna be talking about Paul the puffin and, and just a, a representation of what a puffin might live like in Iceland. And we're gonna go through his life cycle during summer and winter. I'm going to give you some mind-blowing information, some scientific drama. I can't promise enough, but uh, you hopefully will learn a thing or two about the puffins today. And we will end up with the conservation and status and the Heimai legacy that uh, is really a nice story for the conclusion, I think. So let's get into it. So meet Daniel, meet me. I'm an expedition leader with NetHab since 2022. I'm actually really excited to be on board because the company is really representing what I value most and that is um, travel, transformative travel. So um, I've actually guided in Portugal last year and this year is the first time that I'm gonna be guiding the Iceland expedition. And I'm really excited about that. I've got into it because I lived and worked already last year in Iceland and I was actually working as a whale watching and puffin guide. So when I was in at a NetApp training in Colorado a couple of weeks ago, I asked one of our local guides from, from Iceland, hey Solvig, tell me, I've never been guiding, I'm a little bit nervous, what should I learn about more and what should I focus on? And what are people actually interested in when they come to Iceland? And she said one word, plain, puffins. And I was like, oh, okay, this is so good uh, because people are actually really, really excited about the the puffins and we're going to be um, talking and seeing them on our departure depending on when you are coming in the year um, but also one of these pictures you see uh, the waterfall Seljalands floss that's actually one of the waterfalls we're also going to visit during our departure and that one is guaranteed to to see I can't I can't uh, guarantee to see an eruption but I was lucky enough last year um, but the puffins yeah they really are everybody's favorite and for a good reason that we will learn okay but actually meet a puffin there are actually three species of puffins so we talk about the horned puffin and the tufted puffins we will not focus on them because they're specific uh, pacific species that means they don't do not occur in iceland we will not see them during our departure and that's why i won't focus on them they're in the north american side what we are going to be focusing on exclusively is the atlantic puffin this is our guy this is paul the puffin Fratercula arctica is the Latin name, and it basically means something like little friar or little brother of the north. And that has to do with the plumage and this black and white color that looks like a monk's robe, basically. In Iceland, they call it lundi and focus on the beautiful, the photogenic beak and the beautiful eye ornamentation. We will talk about that a little bit more in detail. But notice the name Fratercula arctica, that is actually um, has nothing to do with puffin, whereas this bird, completely unrelated to the puffin, is called Puffinus Puffinus, the Latin name, as you, as you might notice. It is a bit confusing, right? And that's actually a funny story how the puffin got its name. It actually derived from this bird, the Manx Shearwater, because in the 17th century, when there were a lot of sailors in the British Isles, they came across this bird a lot and they would cook it up. And the juveniles of that bird, it would they would puff up when they were both. The meat was very fatty, so it would puff up, it would swell up in the boiling water. And this is how this bird actually was called the Manx puffin at first. Later, because maybe these, these sailors were drunk all the time, or I, I can't guarantee, I'm not sure, but it jumped basically over to the Atlantic puffin because they seem to have a similar nesting strategy. They breed on islands, they dig burrows, so the same thing happened. And 
the name basically jumped from one species to the other. And that story is forever, or maybe forever, uh, cemented in the fact that the Manx shearwater is called Puffinus Puffinus, and our guy, the Atlantic Puffin, is actually Fratercula arctica. So I just thought that was a funny introduction. But let's get into the puffins in Iceland. We are focusing on, or I'm focusing so much on the Icelandic population, not only because we're seeing them on the departure in Iceland, but also we have the biggest breeding colony here in Iceland. We have roughly have 60% of the world's puffins, puff, uh, puff, Atlantic puffin population. Of course, we have to take that with a little bit of caution. They are estimates and they're changing all the time. So we have to keep that in mind. But with more than 2 million breeding pairs, it's actually the most common bird. So we might think, what's the fuss about, right? Why, why is it so special? Why do so many people come uh, for these birds? Um, when we talk about puffins, Iceland in islands in general seem to be very attractive. And that is mostly to, predate, uh, to prevent predation by a land-based mammal. Another very photogenic and cute animal that hopefully we might be spotting, the Arctic fox, okay? They cannot reach these islands that the puffins prefer, and that's why you will find them a lot on islands. Um, actually, this map on the right here in the picture that shows um, where the puffins, where there's a lot of breeding colony, but it doesn't show the size of the colony. So actually in the south, off of Iceland, off of the main main land, there is the Westman Islands. It's an archipelago and uh, archipelago, and there you see the biggest breeding colony with 830,000 pairs. But we're going to be traveling to the northwest. We are going to be one of the few people who make it into the West Fjords, and we have three days to spend there. Go to Vigor Island, which is right where these three dots in the fjord are that that's the breeding colony there and we are will be surrounded by up to 30,000 breeding puffins so really really many in the whole world there might be up to 10 million but that's not only nesting matures but also immature ones and like i said remember this is very rough estimate because these numbers are changing right now all the time when we talk about puffins and culture we will you will probably have noticed that they become somewhat of an unofficial icon of Iceland. And that is surprising, at least for some of this local people, because they are like, they have been living with these puffins for so long. And if you ask them, they're like, oh yeah, puffins. Yeah, I guess they're nice. They taste good. That's what some of them might say to you because they have been living with, with them for so long. They are so normal for them. And only us as, as tourists, as foreigners coming to, to Iceland and observing these animals, they are re recognizing, oh yeah, it's actually a pretty cool bird. And they of course create now a lot of um, economic opportunity for these Icelanders. Um, but for most of the history, they have been crucial as part of their culture, as part of their history in terms of food sources. We will talk about that also a little bit later, but always keep in mind, Iceland has this tradition of hunting puffins because it's a very harsh environment. It's always been about survival. So I, uh, the puffins have, have always served as an important animal protein. Surprisingly, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, that's actually where the puffin is, and is the official bird. And in Iceland, it's not the puffin, it's the gear falcon or falco rusticalus. And that's the one that actually is preying on puffins, a known predator of the puffins. So here we see for the first time Paul in all his glory. Hello, say, say hello to Paul, our little puffin friend. We see this beautiful black and white plumage in the sunlight. We see these orange feet or legs. We see the very colorful beak and the beautiful eye ornamentation. This friar appearance is actually not coincidental. It's basically an evolutionary adaptation and it serves as camouflage. Because now if you think about the puffin sitting on the water surface and a big bird of prey flying over knee, it might be the gear falcon. He will look down on the water surface and all he see is the black tiny little puffin dot disappearing in the vastness of this dark surface of water. Same for underneath. If you're imagining known predators from underneath, which is big fish like sharks or even seals, they might look up and they might only see the bright sky, the bright plumage of the chest. 
so it basically serves as a camouflage and just to give you a rough idea because i know you've all seen beautiful instagram pictures of puffins but they're actually tiny if you if you think about it they're only 10 inches when they're standing and about one lb, LB uh, one pound of of weight so very very tiny birds actually but nonetheless very spectacular to see in in the wilderness and they are so adorable and part of the charm is because they are monogamous so let's say paul it's beginning of of spring or summer um it's the middle of april end of april and paul just returned to his breeding colony where he was born even and now he's waiting for pauline his beloved partner mating made for life because these puffins they made for life they are very monogamous and of course that's so romantic so these puffins really know how to love each other and uh it's really nice because they actually have something called a billing ceremony we call that here on the left hand side when they meet that can be outside uh out out of the breeding colony in the water some miles before the colony um they will meet and they bill or when they're on the island already and they meet in front of their burrow then they will also do this billing ceremony in which they rattle their beak together and in front of each other to basically say, oh, I've missed you so much. It's been so long without you. So nice to be reunited. And sometimes we don't know yet if that's co coincidental or if it's actually uh, voluntarily. Some puffins feel attracted to that and they will, they will come by, have a look and, and be like cheering them up. Like, yeah, good for you that you're reunited. Uh, there's a lot of things going on with this um, beak so the beak seems to be very very um, signaling um, strength health also it might be helping the couple to recognize each other because that's something that's very poorly understood how they do that if it's just visual cues we will talk about another theory in a second but it might have to do also with the beak because only in 2018 they found out that the beak is actually biofluorescent, okay? So if you shed UV light on this beak, it will actually shine in a different color. So really fantastic. There's a whole dimension we're missing out on because with our eyes that are quite complex already, uh, we have no idea how they communicate with these colors, these puffins. Really recent development, really, no, really nice to know, but we do know that it plays a significant role maybe in sexually signif sig uh, signaling strength or, or um, being an attractive partner or recognizing each other. Uh, but it might be not so romantic as we thought, because it might be that the puffins actually stick more to the real estate than to their partners. Okay, we know, for example, that they always return to the same burrow that they've been using and using over the years when they come back to the breeding colony. And it might be that just because they're spotting the same puffin at the same Call, uh, at the same burrow that's why they keep up with that puffin oh you're using that burrow okay it must be you so this is maybe a different theory uh why they um might recognize or make up with each other for so long one thing we do know for certain is that when they are in the colony when they are back on their breeding colony they are very very gregarious they're very very social you see that on the right hand side here lots of puffins at the same place and um, actually um, they are a little bit like us in the sense that they will not go down on on the breeding colony or on the island where the breeding colony is if there's no other puffin so what they will do is a couple of days before the summer starts they will float at sea quite close to the island and they will congregate there and only when there's enough puffins will they fly over uh, and go together to the island. So imagine us on a restaurant or looking for a restaurant. We see empty ones. We're like, nah, we're not going there. And we're waiting for some other people to sit down first before we feel more comfortable. Oh yeah, this might be a good place for us to go as well. So the puffins are like that. It serves, of course, a different function. It's more like to, evade, to avoid predation because if they go in numbers, it's not so easy to pick them out one by one, even from air-based predation. Okay, but a lot of these um in their in their burrows actually they have two chambers so we see the puffin here on the left sitting in its burrow and um they have two chambers there paul is a very clean bird he needs to be very clean they have a toilet chamber there or or some some chamber for the waste basically you could say and that's why they are very clean and because of their colony life because of being so social 
um, they need to have a lot of communication skills. They need to be very sociable. They need to they use a lot of body language. And actually, that's kind of a nice story here. Um, a friend of mine just two weeks ago, when she was working in, in the old harbor where the, most of the whales and, and puffin tours start in Reykjavik, she spotted one of these puffins or Paul maybe for a visit in the old harbor where we have never seen him before. Um, and what, he, what he's doing here is, is not very exaggerated, but it is a low profile walk. Okay, And that means it's basically tucking your head in, walking with a back lowered and basically saying, oh, I don't mean any harm. I'm, I know I shouldn't be here. I'm just minding my own business. Please don't hurt me. So that's what the Puffin signaling there. They will use this kind of low profile walk when they're walking through the colony, maybe towards their burrow, but when they are away from their own burrow. On the other hand, we know of a pelican walk or pelican stance, and that is when the puffin is standing very erect, very stiffly in front of his of his own burrow, and he might puff up his chest a little bit. He might have his tuck his head tucked to the chest, and he might stump even his feet, and that is to to show strength, to show I'm going to protect this place. This is my burrow. Uh, so they have all these communication cues. It's quite funny to observe that, and we might even observe this when we see them on bigger islands, hopefully. Um, that being said, I told you already that they are quite silent and very clean. They need to be because they are keep their uh, plumage in, in, in order with their uh, preening glands. They spend a great deal of their time keeping it clean because this is what insulating them from the cold water around them. This is what protects them and really important to them. Silent is actually maybe a little bit uh, too easy. They are silent, but only when they are in their, uh, when they're out there at sea, you, you might know from penguin colonies how loud they are, how, how dirty they smell. Well, you won't get to see or hear that with puffins. They're actually really, really uh, low profile, you could say. But um, you will hear them if you, if you listen to them in their, in their burrows, they vocalize quite a bit. And we will try to listen what that sounds like here for a sec. I have to tell you, it's, it's basically somewhere between a chainsaw and a laughing cow. That's the closest association I always have. Yeah, it's always surprising to me how they sound, uh, just to give you a few, uh, a short impression of what it sounds like, because who would have thought how these puffins sound, but they do, of course, vocalize in their burrows a lot with their partners. Okay, so Paul just arrived at the breeding colony. He's really happy to reunite with his Pauline, and now he's got to maintain himself. He goes out, he's adapted perfectly to great diving. He's actually such a great diver that he can dive easily to the depth of the Statue of Liberty. So we're talking about 200 feet almost. That's the frame of the statue you see here. 200 feet, that's the maximum diving capacity of the puffin. Um, he will, however, prefer to, to only dive for maybe 85 feet. That's the rough average, let's say. And he's going to stay submerged maybe for a minute, less than a minute, most probably half a minute. They, he's going to be only fishing by sight and um, will propel himself almost, it looks like flying underneath the water. And he will propel himself like flying underneath the water to find the fish. And what you see here on the picture is the preferred um, species of fish that they prey upon here in Iceland. That is the lesser sand eel. Not actually an eel species, but it is a longish fish. I think that's where it derived its name from. And you can see the beak, again, very useful. It has these serrations in the upper beak on the edge, and it basically enables the puffin to hold many, many fish in the same place before needing to come up or fly home without it. So uh, the record, I think, is 62. But on average, they bring up 10, 10 fish like that. Uh, and take them home or eat them directly. 
and they actually don't use to don't, don't need to drink any water they take the water right from their uh, from the fish and uh, get rid of the excess salt by the salt uh, by specialized salt filters or salt glands in their nostrils and um, also through the kidneys but of course if it was so easy i mean he's perfectly adapted to swimming right he can dive so very great he's no problem down there but he's got a problem and that is the arctic skua okay the arctic skua already has it in its latin name parasiticus he this bird is known for kleptoparasitism and it basically means that he will harass paul in midair when he's coming back with some fish in the mouth and had harassed the bird so long until the poor puffin drops all the food and then the skua will rob this fish and feed on it itself okay so poor paul then has to go again so even though it looks simple they only need like maybe 40 fish which is still equates to about 20 percent of body weight in the case of of paul the puffin um it may it is much made much harder by the presence of the arctic skua and we will we might even see these attacks they're quite stunning to observe um and I will tell you when we're going to be seeing them. But on the other hand, clumsy aviator, you know, this great diving skills, they come at a cost. These puffins are not really adapted to being great in the air. They're basically, I always like to say this, one, tray, one, one step away from being a penguin. And even though they are not related, these penguins and puffins, there is something called convergent evolution, where in the same where, where they're completely separated spatially, but there are similar conditions climatically and so, and so, so on in the Antarctica and, in, and close to the poles. And that means that they adapted similar traits by evolutionary pressure. And so these puffins, great at diving, looking similar, sturdy builds, perfect for a, a life at sea, but in the air, they are somewhat clumsy. They have a hard time landing. They need to flap their wings three to 400 times a minute. So it's really, taking them a lot of effort it's really energy taxing and that's also why these schoolers have such an easy time because they're much more maneuverable than these um, puffins are and although i know it's really bad quality please forgive me for that but i thought this is such a funny example of paul being clumsy so here he is sitting on the breeding colony looking out maybe trying to collect a little bit of breeding material we don't know for certain and then one moment of not being attended oh there he goes poor paul <laughs> so i think it just adds to their charm it's certainly something that that makes me smile every time when i see such behavior when they almost fall into the sea or something like that that really makes me smile and i hope you're gonna feel the same way about it but what is it actually all about well i'm going to tell you after a zip of water of course they come back to the breeding colony to breed right and paul and pauline as much as they are in love they have one purpose of being reunited they want to have offspring and this cute offspring that you see here an almost fledged bird is actually called a puffling <laughs> how adorable is that the puffin baby is called a puffling. Yeah, that's that's already I can stop the presentation here now. But but I mean, it's really nice. Uh, the parents actually take turns in incubating the egg for about six weeks. And then it's basically it might not be precise, but it's rough estimate. And then it's another six weeks before the puffling fletches and is able to sustain itself um, during this time on our trips. It might be the first time because Right now, this uh, puffling on the on the picture is actually very, very um, prone to be predated upon, and that means it's usually staying very inside inside the burrow. It's not going to leave it for these six weeks. So, because there might be some gulls, there might be some other species that try to attack it and and kill it, and so it will stay inside. We're not going to most likely see any fledglings, any any uh, young pufflings, but we know that there is activity going on or that these puffins have hatched by the when the when Paul starts returning with a fish load of uh, with a beak full of fish okay because usually the, he and Pauline might just stay out at sea hunt there even sleep there and then they would just feed there on their own but now when they come back with a fish load 
um, for the young pufflin, then they are prone to attacks by the skua, and that's how we know, okay, they have hatched, now there are pufflings around without seeing them actually. So, and this might be in time for some of the later trips in July, maybe August still, this is when we're gonna see these attacks most likely. And there's a myth, an old story actually, about these poor pufflings. You see, imagine this baby being a, a young puffling. There's the myth that at the end of the summer, when it's all over, let's say the chick is raised successfully, then the puffins will provision, will drop one last provision to the puffling and then they leave never to be seen again. And poor puffling, it's sitting there, it feeds on the last provision, but then it gets really, really upset and it's getting really, really hungry and hangry and eventually it's gonna come out full of desperation and trying to find its own fish. Well, that's how the old story went. In reality, it's much more like my own experience, okay? So actually it's the parents having a much harder time to let go of their children when they think it's time to be on their own and find their own way, especially the mothers in my case. Uh, but for the puffins, it's kind of similar because uh, they found out or because of some um, camera traps, they actually saw that they provision the nest even when the puffling had already departed. Okay, so Paul and Pauline, really good parents. They're not leaving them. Don't worry. Uh, actually, they're making more than they have to do. And then let's talk about them in winter. Let's say the work is done. The puffins are, the puffling has, has left. Everything went successfully. And now they are getting ready to leave. That might be also keep that in mind for our, for the trips that might be starting the middle of August. By the end of August, it's pretty much over. You might still see a couple of puffins at the beginning of September, but that's that's not so many anymore for sure. That might get rarer and rarer to see the puffins, okay? Because they leave after the puffling has left also. And then they go through molt at sea, and that just goes to show how secondary a flight for them is because between January and March, they will not be able to fly. They're completely flightless. And it's this is how they look then. So they don't have to look good for their partners anymore. They don't have to look good for the tourists anymore. They shed the skin on the beaks. They, they go through molt and they look much grayer. And it's really, this is a quite nice picture by Laura Erickson who provided the picture. It's really not easy to spot this at sea. This is probably taken in a zoo or, or something like that. But it's not easy to see it because it, the, you gotta imagine the vast North Atlantic Ocean south of Greenland, that's where most of these puffins will migrate to. And it's so vast that some of them might have the space of one square mile, okay? Like really a lot of space for one puffin only. And it's because um, they stretch out a lot. They kind of got tired of the community life, of the colony life. They know the secret to a healthy relationship. They're like, okay, my partner, I love you. I'm gonna see you next year again. But for now, I need to breathe on my own a little bit. And they do that for about eight months without touching soil, some of them, okay? It's actually crazy to think about these routes. Some of them migrate for 4,400 miles across the North Atlantic almost to the west side of Greenland, to the Labrador Sea, and then they come down all the way to the Mediterranean, to the Canary Islands. That's the maximum recorded individual. We know that now a little bit more than before because before we only had rings, now we have tiny geolocators and they slowly start to unravel the mystery of the winter puffin, okay? And so there's a lot of things really interesting that I'm gonna tell you about shortly. One of the things that is happening is that no root is genetically fixed, okay? This, that means that the migration pattern, the migration route is unique for every single individual. So it cannot be genetically fixed. Another thing is though that we also know is that the puffling, when he goes out, he's not taught by the parents where to migrate. So it's also not something taught by the parents. So that leaves the question, how do they find their route and how do they find it again? Because once they establish the route, they are basically sticking to that root consistently, consistently over the years for better or for worse, okay? So it seems to, to, to society or to, to the scientific community as though they would try out their root when they're the puffling, when they leave the nest, and then they will stick to it no matter what. How they find it though, 
that is not very easy for us to say. It might be a mix of factors. It might be visual cues that we have no idea about. It might be that magnetic field that we know from some other birds or animals. It might be the stars. We simply don't understand yet how they are able to find it. But here's, I remember I kind of um, took away the romance when I said it might be about the real estate, not so much about the partner. Well, here's a fact you might like for that romantic puffin imagination. And that is that research has shown that puff, puffins that stick together or that are closer together during the migration, they are able to synchronize their arrival back at the puffin colony in, in summer. They, they are able to synchronize their arrival with, with the prey being around. And so they have a higher breeding success. So actually the message here is that puffins who stick closer to each other are actually more successful parents. So if that is not romantic, I don't know what is. So really nice. On the other hand, it seems to be more important how the females are doing during winter um, because they are, their well-being, their fitness is uh, an indicator for the reproductive success of the next year. So this time is very little known. Lots of things can happen in eight months. We are just slowly starting to learn more and more. And even when they are observed at the breeding colony, when they are already land-based, we learn a lot. And one of the newest things that we've learned is that puffins might actually smart be smart seabirds. Okay, there's a study by Fayette, Hansen, and Biro, one of the leading puffin specialists or researchers of 2019, and they made the bold claim that seabirds' physical cognition may have been underestimated based on what they had observed with the puffins. So let's see what they saw. So this is just a video actually taken from Iceland. So you might be able to see this also when we go to Rigor Island. Be pay, pay some attention. We're gonna look at look at it more than once because it's quite short, but there you go. Did you see that? Okay, let's try again and, and I, will, I will tell you a little bit. Look how he picks up the stick. And then in the last moment of the short clip, Paul seeming, seemingly used to, seems to use it as the tool to scratch himself. So we are talking big here. We're saying they have observed tool use in the puffins. How amazing is that? Okay, let's not get carried away. It, it is of course a bold claim to make. The tool use, seabirds are not known, no seabirds, you, you might know it from dolphins, you might know it from, from primates, you might know it even from birds like ravens that they use tools, but seabirds in general don't seem to be capable and they now include the puffins as seabirds in showing tool use. They have recorded two instances over seven years, one off camera in Wales, or I think it was Scotland, and the other one, this one is from Iceland. And now they, they're saying, oh my God, we have completely missed out on the puffin being a smart bird. Even though he's so clumsy, he uses actually tools. But he has got some scientific community, you know, they need to be skepticists. Good, good that they are. And there's some couple of replies in the following year by Auersberger and research colleagues and also Farah. And they say, hey, let's, let's take it easy. What if it was accidental? You know, it might might have been nesting material. The bird um, might have just picked it up to transport it, and something was itchy, started scratching. Also, shouldn't we be able to to observe it more often if if that's something they had learned? Then it, at least the same individuals should show it more often, but they don't, right? Two instances in seven years is not really a lot, and and that's kind of a counter argument in itself. And they also claim that they don't even have a reason. Remember how I told you they, the puffins spend a great deal of keeping themselves clean. They knew, need to. So most of the body parts they have, they can already reach with their beak. So there's, there seems to be no use in using the beak, uh, using a tool for that. Okay, so, and there's the scientific drama unraveling, of course, Fayette and the same researchers from the first study, they don't let loose yet. They reply to these studies and say, puffin tool use is no fluke. And their argument is that in thousand observations of nests, they have never observed sticks being taken into. It's always been soft material like feathers or grass. 
and that this is not coincidental. And uh, that, of course, when only 1% of puffins are being observed during their time in the breeding colony, so that's basically no time of no, no puffin at all, things can go unnoticed. And to be continued, let's say. We don't, we don't know where this is going to end. No more research is needed. It's good that there's new attention for the puffins and for their, uh, for, yeah, for the species as a whole. But no matter if it's true that they use tool um, um, in, intentionally or not, we know and have learned so much about it, and we are so in love with these puffins, and that should inspire us to protect them, right? And they are in need of um, protection, in dire need of protection, I should say, because um, they are experiencing a sharp population decline since the 2000s, okay? So we're talking 70% of all Icelandic birds that have died since 2000 or 1995, I believe it was. So really, really alarming, um, really, really horrible, actually. Um, they're dealing with a lot of things right now. So that's why I said at the beginning, take these numbers with a grain of, salt, a grain of salt. It's not easy to determine how much there are actually right now and, and how, how many there will be. They are actually now listed on the IUCN list as, as vulnerable for the whole population and on the Icelandic red list, even as endangered or even critically endangered for some populations. And the whole EU population is to be, is projected to decrease by about 50 to 80 percent until 2065. So we have to wonder how did it happen? Like such a numerous bird, the most common bird in Iceland, and suddenly numbers are disappearing and the bird is struggling so much. Poor Paul is really struggling. Why, right? That's the most logical question. Why is it predation? Because they actually have um, made a study in Scotland um, where Lagus marinus, this is the bird is, you see the greater black back gull was, um, was found to increase and while the puffins were decreasing. But what they found out was, nope, that cannot be the reason. The puffins are actually uh, the level of predation is not big enough to drive the, the decline. And even though we have to be careful with extrapolating uh, such results to other places, we can use that. Uh, we, it seems likely that it's the same reason in Iceland. Much more important seems to be global warming. Big global warming, again, as the big player. And there are a couple of examples. I'm not going to be talking about all of them because it's just too much but one of the most important things remember how i said in the westman islands with about 830,000 breeding pairs the traditional and staple food there were the lesser sand eels okay this is what they fed to their young this is what they were thriving on and uh, because sand eels have an optimum tem temperature to to survive and to reproduce of 44.5 degrees fahrenheit sea level temperature uh, they are shifting their their uh, range they're shifting their distribution more north out of range to these puffing puffing uh, breeding colonies in response to warming waters okay so they're moving away out of range of these puffins and that's leaves the puffin starve so that's one of the biggest factors also if you think about their eight months at sea they're really hardy they are made for this life at sea but because of more extreme weather events happening it at sea also related to global warming um, it makes it harder for them to forage and to survive stronger winters okay another reason might be invasive plant species imagine the burrows they are being taken over or these islands being taken over by new plant species or even rats american minks they lay havoc by by growing roots so that the burrows even collapse or or the puffins cannot build it anymore so that's all affect uh, global warming also rising sea levels that might just flood islands that are not very high another factor is overfishing okay you might not have heard about um you might not have heard about eating sand eels or eating capelin another food of many puffin colonies in iceland um but we actually harvested a lot this is not not a picture of lesser sand eels or or capelin but just to show the the dimension of of what we fish and it's used 
the sand eels and capelin are actually used as fertilizer or fish meal. So that's what we use them a lot for, uh, for, for fish farms or to feed them to other animals. And that's depriving the puffins that are already deprived of the food of even more of their preferred fish. And then let's go back to the beginning when I told you about that hunting and, and hunting puffins was always a thing about in the culture of Iceland. Um, it still is. And up to this day, it seems to be responsible for 10% of the decline. So there are still restaurants in Reykjavik that serve puffin meat and it's still happening. For most of the time, it's been a local activity and a local environment, such a harsh environment that it was always about survival and understandable. Animal protein was so scarce, these Icelanders were really happy to have it. Nowadays, the situation changed. Pre-COVID, there were about 2 million tourists, and if only a quarter of them were to try uh, puffin meat, that would be very uh, unecologically and not sustainable for the population. So during the 1970s, they were still hunting um, 150 to 200,000 puffins a year. And even though the, the technique has basically not changed, it's basically a long pole called a half, half four with um, a pole, a, a net at the end and some skilled people, they sit on the edge, these edges and catch them in mid air. The same technique is also part of the reason why it's the problem. And that is because these young puffins, they are circling more aimlessly around the islands about the breeding colonies. And they are the ones being targeted because the mature adults, the ones that have business to do, they will go straight to the burrows with their fish and they will not cycle the islands so much. So they target the younger generation and, and then they are then unable to be recruited into the breeding colony because these puffins are really late when they reach sexually maturity. So even though this has decreased by 90%, this hunting, it still seems unreasonable to me that uh, we're hunting on a vulnerable population that is in, in sharp decline. And I hope you get the message. Another problem that these puffins have is that they are kind of conservatives, right? In the way that they have old school ideals, let's say they made for life, they never leave their breeding colony, they always return to the same place. That's beautiful in, its, in, in a way that we attribute to it, but on another way, it's also harmful for them in the sense that they are really overwhelmed by these sudden changes. They cannot just go to a different island. They cannot just switch to a different food source because they are so proud or so uh, hardwired to return to the same place and prey on the same species. Some puffins have tried. They tried to feed a more uh, subtropical fish called the butterfish but that is too big for, for, for the puffling to swallow. And then they even starve even though there's enough fish. So they, they are still dying and it's, it's not good for them. But there's a bit of hope. I wanna talk about briefly an excursion to the, to the east coast of Maine in the US. Um, you might have heard about Eastern Egg Rock. A lot of effort by this guy, Stephen Kress and his team uh, the project Puffin was founded in 1973 and they translocated a thousand puffins over a span of, I believe, 13 years um, to Eastern Egg Rock Island and um, actually took 10 to 14 old, uh, days old nestlings and they put them into artificial burrows, fed them artificially with vitamin fortified fish and um, actually helped to grow them up. Okay, because they knew of this location fidelity of the puffins, they were hoping that they would come back. And indeed, they did after four years. But they didn't start to breed yet. That took another four years. So in 1981 is when the first four couples actually started to breed. And they were lured down to the island with decoy puffins. Okay, so they actually put some decoy puffins just to signal again, hey, yeah, we are established colony already. It's a good restaurant. You can come down and feel safe. And these puffins did. And, and it's a success story because in 2014, there were about 150 breeding pairs already. So it is possible to establish new holiday colonies. It just depends also on our uh, will to protect them. But of course, they are dealing with the same factors. They're dealing with climate change. And so it's also really challenging to find suitable habitat for them. So we need to think more globally when we want to talk, protect puffins. 
So the future generations of Paul's and Pauline's baby, the young Pufflin here. Um, I didn't finish the story of this young Pufflin. What happens when he leaves his parents, when he or she leaves the nest? Um, they would actually venture out at night to avoid predation and it's all dark. They navigate maybe by, by some lights that they see, the moons or the stars, and they find their way out to sea, never to return again for the next two to three years when they stay exclusively out at sea. And then about four to five years, they will return, they will have a look around, they might fly around, find a nice breeding spot, they will learn from the adults, go with them to the best fishing grounds, and then five, six years old, that's how long it might take for them to start their own family until the baby puffin has become a parent of, him, of himself and, and gives, gives hope and birth to the next generation. Only one puffling a year, okay? That's how rare they are. And it is because they are such long-lived animals that live up to 30 years maximum, 20 on average. So a long life, but very hard to, uh, to help grow them up. But these puffins, actually in the Westman Islands, the, remember the big population in the south of Iceland, um, there's about 5,000 people living on a tiny island in the Westman Islands uh, called Heimai. This is the home island basically, and it has about 5,000 inhabitants, and they run a pu puffin patrol because every end of August, and I find this is such a beautiful story that I'd like to share with you as a sign of a hope, let's say, um, because these puffins, the young pufflings, they get disoriented. They end up in the cities, maybe because of the street lights, not clearly understood why they end up in the streets. It might be because of it, um, but they get disoriented and they die maybe because they're, they're killed by cats or dogs, or maybe just because they don't find their way to see anymore. So every end of August, when this happens, when this starts happening, the kids of Hemai, they run to the streets and they, have something called the puffin patrol in which they go with their parents, try to search for these pufflings, take them home actually in a, in a carton box. And the next day they bring them to the Sea Life Museum where they are checked, measured and banded with a little band around their, their um, leg. And then these kids with their parents will go to the cliffs of Hamer A and really throw these birds, help these pufflings into the sea by throwing them and the puffling then will fly away. So really, really special, um, a really, really beautiful tradition. And you should you see the joy in the in the kids' faces uh, when they help protect this species, the wild animal taking care of it. And that's also what I hope I inspired today in in some of you. Um, you know that you might know that at NetHub we're really all about transformative experiences, and I, I'm really subscribed to that. Because I believe once you've seen these puffins, once you've experienced them in their natural habitat, then you feel inclined, you feel inspired, you almost feel forced to do something about it. Because I can't wait to be there with you and see the awe, you know, because these puffins are so beautiful. I hope you learned that today a little bit more. And um, they could serve as a flagship species for marine environments, for marine health, because where they are, there's good fish, there's good conditions for other seabirds to thrive. And um, so in that sense, we should protect them at all costs. And uh, yeah, we are gonna see them hopefully in, in their natural environment. When you're not too late booked for your September departures, then you then you get almost guaranteed. So before September, I can almost guarantee seeing them afterwards, not so much anymore. Uh, so you will be, getting the chance to maybe even see them tool using, we might be unraveling, it might be some NetHab travelers that are unraveling some more mysteries about these puffins. And with that, I just wanna say thank you. These are my sources that I used, a lot of pictures. Thanks for all the contributors. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank all you. Right. Daniel, thank you so much. Now, before yeah. we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So are, are they subject to the avian flu? Yes, that's great that you brought that up. Um, there has been a, some recent news, most of them untranslated, but I've been talking to a couple of guides also uh, where, where I work now, and 
they are all really alarmed because there seems to be it's not clearly understood what it is yet there's not sufficient data so i want to be careful with a statement about that but there have been hundreds of dead puffins stranded and last year we know that it was the northern gannet that we've seen even at sea uh dead uh, many dead birds now it seems to be the puffins and it seems to be indeed related to the avian flu so another factor that is hitting the population and not making it easier for them to to thrive yeah unfortunately that is terrible yes um so let's talk about um how many eggs that they lay do they lay multiple eggs and how long does it take before they hatch yeah yeah I, actually i that's a really great question um because i forgot to mention that um we kind of we kind of can conclude by their long lifespan. I mean, they live 20 years on average for a bird that is only 10 inches when standing, you know, so it's it's really it's really a tiny bird and it lives 20 years on average. Some of them that have been ringed live up to 40 years. That's the maximum recorded. And that says something, right? Because there are kind of two strategies in the animal kingdom. And that is either we have a lot of offspring and we don't care about them a lot and probably most of them will die or we take a lot of care, we grow old and we have long lives and we put a lot of effort in our offspring. And the puffins is the latter one. So they only have one egg in a year, only one puffling a year. And that's why, of course, they are much more prone to, to de declines in the population because it's so hard for them to recover from that. We also now have the aging population. And that means um, that because of their missing recruitment of the younger generation, we still have high numbers of old puffling, puffins, but once they're done, suddenly the whole population will be down because they're just not many anymore. And it takes about six weeks for them to incubate the egg. So that's, that's the answer. Great, thank you for addressing that. Yeah. So how is it that the puffins are tracked and how is it known that they are monogamous? Okay, so um, track, basically we know this from rings, right? And we can observe these rings also in their, in their burrows. So now what the researchers started doing in research years is, is putting, um, putting cameras, um, camera, camera traps in front of their burrows or even in their burrows, and they can take pictures of the puffins. And we know based on their rings or their tags, okay, these are the same individuals that use the same burrow again, so they are basically monogamous. That's pr pretty much what we know. It used to be pretty much in the dark. Now we have more technology. There's a lot of development. These geolocators, what they use now to, to uh, predict or study their behavior during winter time, they just recently became small enough not to, um, not to, pre or not to disturb the puffins and cheap enough to, to use them in science. So now there's a lot of new data coming up and it's gonna be exciting years to find out how it really works that they, that they recognize each other because we don't know. There might be some extra pair copulations. It's known from many, many populations, many species, but in general, they seem to be mating for life. What happens if a breeding burrow has collapsed or was destroyed somehow? Will, will the puffin couple buy in another empty burrow or build one? Yeah, that, that is a really good question again. Um, it, they might, yeah, but, but let's say this happened on a, on a broad scale. So if, if that only is one, one, uh, one case, a, a, a burrow collapsed, they might build a new one. It might take a year. They might skip breeding. I mean, they might even find a new partner that already has a burrow. That might also happen. You know, that, that, that might be a reason for a breakup, let's say. Um, but they could start a new burrow and it, the the male pole our, our little puffin might attract another female then but on a broad scale that's exactly the problem that i was trying to describe by saying they are conservatives right so they will come back they will try and they would it would be almost wasted effort let's say because there are rabbits taking over or there is a plant species and it's not really helping anymore or there are rats now eating the eggs so all of these factors and the puffins are basically yeah I still love this place for some reason. So it's really hardwired into them. It's not easy to attract them to another island or to better suited habitat. So the puffins are very small and very light. 
Why is it that they need to flap their wings so many times in order to stay in the air? Yeah, well, well, that that's basically because they are they are very small, but for their small build, they are quite sturdy, right? They are quite bulky, and they need to be because diving is much better with these tiny wingspan with a quite sturdy build. It helps them to go down quicker and stuff. But in the air, it's it's quite proportionally speaking, it's quite heavy and it's quite to their disadvantage in flight. So that's why they really need to flap their wings three, four hundred times and wasting a lot of energy. So you will always see them fly quite close to the water surface where also the, the risk of predation is quite lower because they can just dive down into the water. They just feel so much more confident, confident in the water. Got it. Thank you so much. Now, mm. do they only eat That's great fish? questions? Yeah, keep them going. <laughs> so do they only eat fish or do they eat vegetation as well? Uh, so no, as far as I know, I mean, you know, there might be something that our travelers might find out um, during the trip. But uh, so as far as I know, they don't eat vegetation. You might see them um, in different regions. Also, also trying to eat krill or crustaceans, small little crustaceans, you know, so it's, it is, it is, depending on where they are, a, a, a bit more diversity, but in general, the staple food of all puffins is sand eels, capelins, and herring, or young herrings, I should say, because the big ones are also too big for some of them. So, what is it that turns the puffins' uh, face green? Green? Was that I, just a... I, that was maybe the picture of the winter puffin. It actually goes becomes more gray. Okay, so that's it. It goes through molt. It loses the primary feathers. That's when it becomes flightless also, and it sheds the skin on the beak and just becomes a whole lot gray and unattract more unattractive. Let's say. That just goes to show probably that you know the beak has a sexually signaling during breeding season, and afterwards it's not really necessary anymore to look like that. And so they just go through the mold. Gotcha, thank you for that. Yeah. So is puffin hunting regulated in Iceland now? Yes, it is, it is. And there's huge discussions at, at the moment going on about you know if they should ban it completely. There's different regulations. It basically is the right of the landowner to decide if puffins can be hunted on the property or not. And the, the government gives a regulation about uh, the hunting season. So, for example, in the Westman Islands, it used to be six weeks. Over the years, they shortened it more and more. It used Then it was a week, I think, in 2019 or something like that. And now it's down to three days. But even then, it's still about 15 to 20,000 birds that are being killed, not only in the Westman Islands, but also in Grimsey, which is another island off the north coast of Ireland. There, Iceland there, the, the population is doing a little bit better because the sand eels are moving up and there they are still hunting for longer. I think there the hunting season is still six weeks. So it is a big discussion right now. Remember there are these arguments about tradition and also, you know, if it's still sustainable, if it's still viable. And there are a lot of interests clashing. Great, Daniel, thank you so much. Unfortunately, yeah. that's going to be the last question that we do have time okay. for today. So I'm gonna throw it back to you for any closing comments you may have for us. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to thank you really for your attention and for being with me on this webinar. I hope you, you learned a couple of things and I hope it informs you also. If some of you might've been thinking or playing with the thought of going to Reykjavik to try Puffin, you might reconsider based on the information you now have. Or I just want to say that I'm also super happy to be guiding in Iceland this year and see the awe, see the wonder in people's faces when we go on these trips and observe puffins in the natural en environment. So thank you so, so much for, for being part of this today. Daniel, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us yeah. today. Yeah, I really loved it. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm sure we'll be back for another one. All right. And I would also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NADHAB, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at NADHAB.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. 
You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathap.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so we'll much. See you Goodbye. next time.